Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, thank you. I know it's after lunch, so uh, I'll try to uh, make as many jokes as possible to keep you awake through this. Is that okay? All right. Uh, my name is Pratik Patel. Uh, I lead the developer relations team uh, at Azul Software. How many people have heard of Azul? Okay, that's about 50%. How many people know what we do? Okay, same 50%, good. Um, so I'm actually not going to talk uh, about any of the stuff that we do except for the first 60 seconds of this presentation. Um, we make a Java virtual machine which we think is the best one anywhere around. We have a high performance virtual machine and we also provide a OpenJDK build called Azul Zulu which anyone can use for free. And of course, we sell support for that. And our high performance of JVM is called uh, Platform Prime. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we do some performance tests. But uh, just really quickly, uh, out of the box, you can swap out your JVM for Azul Prime, and you'll get at least 20% performance gains uh, for a range of different applications, whether it's Spring Boot or Kafka or whatever. And of course, because you're just swapping out the JVM, there's no code changes, you get more stability and better throughput. Okay, so that's all I'm really gonna talk about this. Um, and what I wanna focus on for this session is to talk about performance testing for Java applications. Um, and you might ask, why sh do I know anything about this, right? Aside from the fact that I work at Azul, and again, we make the fastest JVM uh, in the universe, at, le at least we like to say. Uh, but uh, previously, I was the Java performance lead uh, at a company in the U.S. called AT&T. They're a big telecoms company, but uh, I led the Java performance team for four years. Uh, and of course, now I work at Azul. Okay. So, that's why you should listen to me. Uh, but before we get started on the actual presentation, does anyone know what this TV show is? Okay. It's, it's called Silicon Valley, right? And um, uh, when uh, this TV show was on, I was actually working at a startup and I had to stop watching this TV show because it was way too much like real life. I'm not even joking, okay? So anyways, um, when we talk about performance testing, it, it, if you read the description on this session, the description says that performance testing is not engineering, it's an art form, okay? So we'll dive into what that means a little bit as we do some demos and talk about the different things that you need to know, right? So it really is uh, more about uh, having intuition, using certain tools to gain an understanding of your application and other things like that. So we'll get into that in a, uh, in a few minutes. So I have a question for you. What's the best way to fix Java performance issues? Does anyone want to take a... Yes? What's that? To find that you have an issue. Step number one, find that you have an issue. Okay? Anybody else? Come on, there's got to be somebody else who's... Does anyone, actually, before I get uh, too far into this, how many people do performance testing of their applications or have had to do it in the past? Okay, so that's, that's pretty much everybody in the room. Okay, great. Uh, anybody else want to take a guess? What's the best way to fix Java performance issues? No? Okay, that's okay. So the answer is it depends, right? You knew that was coming, right? So it does really depend. A lot of it depends on what your application does, and you know, what, how big is your application? Are you running uh, in, in a monolith? Are, are you crazy and using Kubernetes? You know, all those kinds of different things, right? So how many people use Cube out of curiosity in production? Okay, that's a few people. I, I thought it would be more, but that's okay. All right, the, and, and like the gentleman that said, uh, the first step uh, to fixing performance issues is to actually find the issues themselves. So that was a good answer, okay? All right, so, um, the problem is, however, it's way, way, way difficult to actually get to the root cause of your performance issues than it should be, right? So what I hope to do in this presentation is to give you all some tools, and a lot of this stuff I know myself, but also I work at Azul Systems where we focus very, very heavily on building a high-performance JVM. So a lot of this uh, stuff that I, I'm going to present today is actually a distillation of things that I've learned with working with our rocket scientist engineers who, whose life it is to make Java run really, really fast, okay? So, what I'm gonna do to start off with, and I'm gonna speed this up as I go along, because I only have 50 minutes. Uh, Simon, is it okay if I take 15 minutes of your talk time? 
No, okay, he said no, so I'm going to have to finish on time. Um, the next presenter is sitting in the front row. So what I want to do is I want to give you the broad level outlines, and then we'll run a performance test of a Spring Boot application. I'll show you some of the tools I use to understand what's happening in the application, okay? So let's get going. All right, so here's the uh, basic steps. Uh, set up a performance test, run a performance test, dot, 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 profit. Okay, of course, that's a joke. Uh, but what we're going to focus on is the dot, dot, dot part here. Right? How do you actually look for different things in your Java application? How do you run those tests? Uh, what are some of the different things that you have to do? But there are nine basic steps when I do any kind of performance testing, whether it's in Java or anything else. So the first one, which is probably the most important, actually, is to have to define your goals. Right? If, if you already have a performance problem, then kind of know that you need to fix something. But you need to also have goals on top of that. And what do those goals mean? We'll look at that in just a minute. And then we have to think about your actual deployment environment. You have to think about the actual app itself. What does the app do? Are you using Kafka? Is Kafka what's slow? Or is the database the bottleneck? Or did someone put a system.exit inside of the code and just gets executed and kills your app? So um, you, you may think that's a joke. But um, in a previous job, there was a programmer on my team who uh, while in the course of writing some tests, had a system.exit somewhere in the code. Right? I'm not joking. And, and just every now and then, the app would just, just completely die. And we're like, what is going on here? Right? And so I, I, so I was scanning through his code, and I said, hey, what's the system.exit doing here? Oh, I just use it for testing. It never gets executed. I was like, are you sure? Because this server keeps dying randomly. So anyways, uh, so don't put a system.exit in your code. Okay? Uh, so think about your app. And so we'll spend a few minutes talking about operating system settings as well. Because, of course, your JVM runs on something. Typically, you're running a Docker container or on Linux or whatever. So you have to think about the app. You have to think about U-limits and other things like that, which we'll dive into also a bit. And then we'll spend a fair amount of time looking at tools for performance testing, collecting that performance test data. And then, after that, analyzing performance results, finding bottlenecks, and then, of course, the last step is fix and test again to make sure that your fix worked. Okay, so nine basic steps. And of course, I'll make the slides available so that you can look at this recipe and follow it also if you like. Okay, All right. So the first thing, defining your goals. All right, if you have a performance issue, then you know you have a problem to fix. But that's not enough in my opinion. You have to do more than that. Okay, and it helps you if you do this up front. I know we try to avoid a lot of architecture, a lot of thinking about an app up front nowadays, right? We, we want to get code, we want to start writing tests, blah, 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 and get some velocity. But where are your possible bottlenecks or where are your current bottlenecks? Is it around latency? Is it around throughput, right? What is your SLA? What's the service level agreement that you have with your, you know, your business analyst or your customer or whatever? And of course, Whenever we're building an app, the main thing we usually care about so that we don't get woken up at 3 a.m. on Saturday morning is the stability of the application, right? So that's probably a given, right? So these are kind of your high-level goals that uh, we want to think about. And when we talk about performance testing, we use something called P99 and P95. And what this means, it, it sounds fancy, but it's not. Basically, all it means is what percentile is your application running in in terms of latency or throughput or performance or whatever you want to call it. We'll talk, let's talk a little bit more about that right now so you, you understand what P99 means, okay? So P99 means 99% of the requests should be faster than the given latency. So what you can do is, or what you need to do, is you need to say every user who comes to our Java application, right, whether you're, let's say you're building a Spring Boot app, Every user should get a response within one second, or five seconds, or 500 milliseconds, okay? And so what you want to aim for is that 99% of your application services a request within that given time frame, okay? So does anybody, does anybody think about this, or anyone have like these SLAs uh, at where they work or for the app you work on? Like do you, do you yes, go ahead. What's your, what do you, do, like, what do you tell your business users, or sorry, your business analyst or your users? What, you say, we'll guarantee you a response in how many seconds? One second, okay. Somebody else over here? Yes. Uh, for all of them? Yes. Wow, okay. So you have four upstream services, 
and request hits all of those, including your app, and you have to give a response within 200 milliseconds. Okay, now, that's a fairly aggressive target. Doable, but fairly aggressive. Okay, so thanks for that. All right, and so the second part of this is only 1% of the requests are expected to be slower than 200 milliseconds or one second or whatever, right? This is what we kind of aim for, or um, depending again on your app and what, what kind of uh, demands your users have, you will adjust that up or down, okay? So let's look and see what this actually means in practice, okay? So what I've done here is on the left, if you add those numbers up, that's 100, okay? So when we run some performance tests, these are the latencies we're getting out. I just made this up, right, just for uh, demonstration purposes, right? So you can see that one request out of 100 comes back in eight seconds. Okay, and then seven, four in, in, uh, in seven seconds, 15 in six seconds, et cetera. But the important part is here what's at the bottom, which is your P95 or your 95th percentile is six seconds, i.e. 5% of requests take longer than that. And your P99 is seven seconds, 1% of requests take longer than seven seconds. Okay, so this is how we think about it and this is how we quantify and this is what we're aiming to measure when we do performance tests. Okay, all right, so. The other things that we think about in terms of latency, throughput, and other performance metrics is what is our minimum, median, and maximum response times? Okay, so you can see, I've, again, I've just made these numbers up for demonstration. Uh, we kind of get a minimum of, let's say, 100 milliseconds. Our median is 200 milliseconds, but we get some requests which are seven seconds or more. Okay, so again, we quantify these things so we have a better understanding of what our system is doing and how we can then explain this to our users in terms of what they should expect when the app is being used by an end user or whatever. Okay, and again, for demonstration purposes here, I'll put a P95 of 0 0.5 seconds and a P99, i.e. the 99th percentile of 1.3 seconds. Okay, so 95% of users, the latency was below 0 0.5 seconds in this example. Okay, does this all make sense so far? Okay, excellent. All right, so how do we actually explain this then to our business people, right? Because if we, if we show them this chart, they'll be like, oh, I don't know what this even means, right? This is how we explain it. We say, we want 99% of users to have the less than two seconds latency, or we need to push 100,000 messages a second through Kafka. So this is in terms that your business people will understand. Okay, so that's how we think about this. All right, so we've talked about this already. So, um, and what does this actually look like when we chart it? We're going to do a chart here in a few minutes, right? But uh, when we chart this out and we look at latency versus percentile, this is what it looks like. You can see I'll put the, the equal sign exactly where uh, the P95 is, and then the P99 in this case is 200 milliseconds. But you get the idea. This is how we visually graph this and how we think about this in terms of 99th and 95th percentile, right? All right. So, Let's move on to the next step. Think about your environment, right? Are we running on cloud? Is it on-prem? Are we doing a single server? Is it a distributed monolith, right? So these are all things that we have to worry about. And when we think about environments, um, this is gonna sound insane, but the best place to do performance testing is in production, right? And again, this sounds a little crazy, you're like, you're gonna run a test on production? The answer is yes. So what we do at Azul, when we go and talk to customers and we look at their performance problems, we always, always recommend, let's try to run this test on production, okay? And we don't run it across like an entire cluster. What we'll do is we'll say, let's, let's run this test on one node in, let's say, your 10 node cluster. Right, but so that way we don't bring the whole app down because that would be very bad, of course, right? But we at least, hey, let's do it on this one and let's see what happens, right? Because unfortunately, there's not really a good way to completely replicate every nuance of a production system, right? So when I was a performance engineer, full-time performance engineer in a previous job, what we actually did, and again, this is gonna sound crazy, is we actually built out an exact replica of production. Right? It was basically $100,000 worth of hardware that mirrored production. And we ran production tests, or we ran performance tests on that. Right? So if you have a lot of money, <laughs> then by all means, set up something that looks exactly like production. But if you don't, the best place to test is actually on production. Okay? So 
Production performance analysis is the best. It can be non-intrusive if you're careful. And you, know, you can try to replicate that uh, production type of environment in a test lab if you, know, if you have the, the means to do so. All right. And when we think about how do we actually do this, we want it to be non-intrusive. So using an agent, unfortunately, adds overhead. Right? So if you use an agent or if you're using something like AppDynamics or Cygnos or whatever to monitor it, you know, how many people are running those kinds of APM type of tools in production? Okay, so there are a few people. So you know, whenever you put in an agent that takes these statistics out of a running VM, you always have to pay a cost, right? There's a little bit of added latency. You're basically, you're, you're adding something else into the mix, which may also become a bottleneck, right? But like I said, if you're running a 10 node cluster, you can just run a performance test on one of those nodes and, pr and pray that doesn't bring the whole system down, okay? And, uh, obviously, nowadays, things are a little bit more complex because we run in cloud environments. So one of the things that I like to do for cloud environments, whether it's AWS, GCP, or Microsoft Azure, is uh, I like to build out Terraform scripts that allow me to bring up like 10 servers and all the storage and networking and all that, run my tests, and because I don't want to spend $1,000 a minute uh, for any longer than I need to, I shut everything down and I rebuild everything uh, with Terraform as much as possible. Now, what's the problem with doing this, though? Aside from, you know, the added complexity. Anyone want to take a guess? Very good. So the gentleman said, you don't have the same information as production. So yeah, I can build out my app tier like, like this with the Terraform script. But what about the, the gigabytes and terabytes of data that I have somewhere, right? So you're absolutely right, okay? So, Again, best place to test, unfortunately, is production, but that's a very good answer, okay? And of course, when we're on the cloud, we typically do horizontal scaling, whether you're using Kubernetes or distributed monolith or whatever. And so then we also have to accommodate for things like network and storage and how fast is the storage that we're hooking into underneath. Do we have our, our virtual private networks set up exactly the same as production, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So again, these are just some things to be uh, aware of. And uh, hopefully this isn't being recorded, but um, one of the problems with cloud environments is that there's typically less CPU time slicing available on whether it's on AWS, GCP, or on Azure as compared to running on your own server in your own data center, right? They, they slice the CPU cycle so, so thin that, again, that can be a little bit of a problem that you have to be aware of. And then, of course, you have to worry about ramp up and other things like that, okay? All right. So let's uh, move on and think about your application a little bit. Okay, so are we running Spring Boot? Are we running Java EE? How many people are still running Java EE out of curiosity? Okay, so a few people. Uh, are we doing something like event streaming with Kafka or with Red Panda? And of course, uh, we talked a little bit about this, but what about external resources like a database, right? Is that your bottleneck? How do you fix something like that? Okay. And I know Reactive is all the rage right now, uh, but unfortunately, Reactive is not uh, Reactive style programming is not a silver bullet uh, when it t comes to performance issues, uh, because you can still have loads of bottlenecks uh, within your environment, even if you're building something fully reactive. Is anyone building fully reactive applications? Okay, well, what are you guys using, just out of curiosity? Vertex? What's that? Project Reactor, right, that's the spring thing, right? Yep, okay, got it. Okay, and the other thing is, if you're running in a Kubernetes-style cluster, do you do auto-scaling? Does, do your does your nodes in your app go up and down depending on demand, right? So I don't think a lot of people do auto-scaling in Kubernetes currently. How many people are using auto-scaling in Kube right now? Anybody? Oh, wow, okay. So how's that working out for you guys? I'm just kidding. So we'll talk about that later. So, uh, all right. Right. The other thing, uh, in terms of knowing your app, do you have uneven load across your application? Is, is it 100% properly distributed across nodes in your cluster? And I think the biggest takeaway out of this specific set of slides is the second bullet here, which is, how much capacity do you need at peak? Okay. If you, if you always have like a steady load like this, then you know, you're, go, you're, you're great. Right? You don't have a lot of variables to deal with in terms of uh, you know, how do you accommodate for load. But most people generally have an app that goes up and down in load, right? So how, do you, how much capacity do you need at peak? And how do you figure out what that capacity is? So this is another challenge you have to think of uh, in terms of knowing your application. All right, 
So uh, let's move on and talk about operating system settings. So there's a whole bunch here, but I just want to highlight a few and at least give you an idea of some of the things that you should think about in terms of OS settings, right? So there's something called uh, the virtual machine minimum free kilobytes. So how much, how much memory is actually allocated to your Java process? So what, what we like to typically do with Azul is we like to set this to be one gigabyte in size, right? Or whatever the size of your VM is, all right, your heap. Uh, of course, uh, everyone knows what U-limit is. Uh, typically, you want unlimited um, uh, U-limits on that. And then we can use just some simple command line tools like LSOF to get additional statistics in terms of our OS settings, right? But the, one of the, I think the biggest takeaway here is that it, for any Java application, always, always, always disable swap. Never use swap space, okay? Because that can be an immediate uh, problem once whatever machine you're running on, whether it's your own server or running on the cloud, um, you want to use the second line on this slide to turn off swap. Because you never want your JVM to swap memory uh, out of memory and into disk. Okay, that can be a huge problem with performance. So, all right. So let's, uh, let's do a demo now, uh, after I talk about these tools for a few minutes, but I'm just gonna use some simple tools here, right? There's a whole bunch of tools. People will try to sell you different types of tools, but you don't actually need a lot of different tools to, to be able to do good performance analysis, okay? So uh, I'm gonna demo in just a second Visual VM with the Visual VM garbage collection plugin, okay? So you see that in action in a few minutes. Um, you can also use something like Java Flight Recorder to take uh, performance uh, profiling information, right? But the problem with the, this Java Flight Recorder and taking those profiling snapshots is it is an intrusive type of tool, right? So it adds overhead into your application. But sometimes, if you can't figure out what's wrong with the other tools, then you do need to reach into something like JFR, Java Flight Recorder, and take uh, profiling snapshots and then analyze them by hand, okay? And uh, for load testing, there's a whole bunch of different tools. Uh, in this, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to demo JMeter. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone's at least familiar with it. A lot of people use Gatling, uh, which is another uh, load testing tool, and that works reasonably well too. Okay, so it's up to you what you use for that. That that part is not uh, super um, uh, super difficult. Okay, and then a couple of other command line tools, uh, JStack and JStat for seeing uh, what your VM is doing, uh, taking snapshots of threads. Uh, taking snapshots of what the garbage collection looks like, et cetera, okay? So one tool that I do want to highlight, uh, this is a tool created by Azul's CTO, Glenn, uh, Gil Tenney. Uh, it's called jhiccup, right? And I want to explain, and, and it's freely available. You can come to our website and download it. But I find this tool is actually really, really useful, right? Of course, all the other tools are also useful, but this one is actually really good. And I'll show you a demo in just a second also. All right, so what jhiccup does is it measures the pauses that can affect a running JVM, okay? So basically, a pause can be from within the VM, i.e. a garbage collection, or it could be something that's in the operating system, right? So what this tool does is it basically measures what those pauses are. And it's not just the VM, it's all the way down to the metal, right? Or whatever you're running on, okay? So once you have this analysis out of it, and this is not an intrusive tool, right? This is why, I, this is the other reason I like it. Um, we use a histogram log analyzer to see the output of jhiccup and, and it basically build out that graph that we were looking at earlier with the P99 and the P95, i.e. the percentile. And the way jhiccup works is it uses a single thread that sleeps for a second, it wakes up and records the time since it last went to sleep. That's all it does. But surprisingly, this is a very, very useful tool. Okay, we'll see in action in just a minute, okay? And so if you want a visual representation of what this looks like, it's looks, it looks like this. Basically, there's a single thread. It wakes up and says, what time is it? Goes to sleep for a second, wakes up and says, what time is it? And records how long that is. So basically, it allows you to see if there are any pauses in your application that are keeping this thread from waking up exactly one second apart. You could adjust the time, by the way, but one second is typically enough, okay? So you get the idea here in kind of what that looks like, all right? And uh, when, when we see pauses, this is kind of what it looks like right here, right? You can see everything is green, but if you're getting pauses, uh, they'll show up, and uh, it basically says, okay, every millisecond, I'm gonna wake up. When was the last time I was awake? 
another millisecond, wake up, et cetera. Okay, you'll see in just a second so it makes sense to you. And this is how you run jhiccup. You basically install it as an agent uh, as part of your application. And this is actually what we're going to be running, this exact thing, is uh, the Spring Pet Clinic application. Everyone's familiar with the Spring Pet Clinic application by now, right? Yeah, okay. All right. So uh, the other thing that I'm going to use uh, is the Azul uh, Garbage Collection Log Analyzer. Uh, unfortunately, this is not something we've open sourced yet, but hopefully it will be soon. Um, and it's specifically made for Azul uh, Prime, which is a high-performance VM. But there is a build yet. Uh, there is a build for uh, OpenJDK and Zulu. Um, but there are other log uh, GC log analyzers that you can also use. Okay, and this is what the demo setup looks like. Uh, we're going to use JMeter to drive a Spring Boot application, and we're going to look at garbage collection and the jhiccup logs, as well as look at it in Visual VM and Visual GC. Okay? So uh, let's pray to the demo gods that this works. So We have a lot of moving parts with this demo. Okay, so I have my uh, histogram log analyzer up. Uh, this is my garbage collection analyzer. Um, this is Visual VM. You can see that uh, nothing is running right now in terms of, or Spring Boot app's not running yet. And then uh, I have JMeter here to drive the tests. All right, so let's go fire up our application. Let me make sure this is right. Let's make this bigger. Okay, so uh, <laughs> you can see what I've done here, right? Uh, I have purposely constrained the uh, heap size. The XMX setting uh, sets the size of the heap. So does anybody know when you fire up, uh, like let's say Java 11 or 17, what's the default heap size if you don't specify one? Does anybody know? 25% of your memory, are you sure? Okay, what was the other answer over here? Okay. I thought it was one gigabyte, I'll have to check. Do you know what it is, Garrett? No, okay. All right, anyways, for this demo, I've uh, purposely constrained the memory so that we, we can watch this blow up. It's always fun to watch something blow up, right? So, all right, so we're gonna start the Spring Boot application here. And then, okay, it's up and running. And then I'm going to hook into that with my visual VM, okay, bring up the monitoring tool. Let's full screen this, right? How many people are not familiar with uh, visual VM? Okay, so a few people, okay, it's fine. It's relatively simple tool as you can see. On the top left, we have CPU usage, but what we're interested in this specific case is what's on the right here. Uh, that is our memory, right? That's our overall heap size and uh, what's the uh, used and unused heap for this. And We'll also be watching this. So this is the visual, <coughs> sorry, the visual VM garbage collection monitoring tool. Okay, so you can see we're not doing anything right now. So the, um, the memory that we have here, right? So you can see this is our old gen, our meta space, and then our young gen right here, okay? So, and I'm just using a standard VM here, uh, I'm using, uh, Zulu version 18, what did I use here? Yeah, it's uh, basically OpenJDK, our OpenJDK build called Zulu of Java 18. Okay, so now, this is where the fun begins. So I'm gonna fire up this test, All right? And now you'll see uh, this thing take off, okay? So what, what this, this is just, again, this is just a standard uh, pet clinic application, Spring Boot Pet Clinic, and if you look inside of the source folder, they actually provide a JMeter uh, test. So you basically, you can run this by just cloning the Spring Pet Clinic uh, repo, start up Spring Boot, and then you'll find the JMeter test plan uh, inside the source directory. So I didn't want to create anything fancy so you all could replicate this test at, uh, yourself and play around with these tools, okay? So you can see this is running now. Um, we're using lots of memory. Uh, because this is going in and it's creating like a new object and then updating an object and deleting it, blah, 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 right? It's just running the standard test plan. But you can see this is running here. Um, let's go look at the CPU. I'm not really taxing the CPU very much here, but you can see you're using a little bit of CPU here, right? About, about uh, 7 to 10% CPU. But you can see that classic seesaw in the heap usage here, right? So allocate objects, allocate objects. We start using memory. Garbage collector kicks in. It frees up that memory for more requests, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty, pretty standard stuff in terms of um, a Java application. Now, let's go and look at a couple of different things here, okay? So first of all, let's go look at the garbage collection log, which will be 
here. Uh oh. That's not good. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I did say that, you know, we're going to have trouble with this demo, right? So uh, let me do this real quick. Let's go. Ooh, we even created some errors here. All right. I think we pushed a little bit too hard. All right. So let's do this. Let's just start fresh here. Oh, dang it. Okay. Let's start our. Sp oh, damn it. Okay. Let's make sure that I've created, nuked all the old logs, cleaned out all the crap. Okay. Let's start our Spring Boot app again. Okay, and we'll f start up the perf test again. Stop. Okay. Let's make sure that this is running properly now. All right. Nope. Still not happy. It helps if I stop the test. All right, let's stop this. Okay, now it's running. Let's restart our perf test. There it goes. Let's open up Visual VM and make sure that this is running. Okay, there it is. It is running now. I'll let this run for about 60 seconds and talk about this. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at uh, the GC logs, and we're also going to look at the jhiccup output. Again, the jhiccup is that thing, that thread that wakes up and sees if there's been any pauses, right? And we'll get a better idea of what our 95th and 99th percentile in terms of response time is for this application. All right, so we're going to keep this running, and hopefully now... Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, here, let me make this full screen. All right, so this is basically our garbage collection output. Um, you can see that when the app first started up as Spring Boot was getting set up, it, cr it creates a bunch of objects and then uh, it goes and garbage collects them. So you can see there's a big GC pause right as we started up this application. But that's just the application getting warmed up. Okay, we can talk a bit more uh, if we have time about warm up time and uh, all of your Java devs so you know that it takes a while for the just in time compiler to really get efficient, right? So there's a lot of inlining and other th method inlining, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that that happens to, to optimize the application as it starts running and it's under load, okay? But that's the initial setup time. And it looks like we hit a really long GC right here. Let's see how long that was. Let me zoom in a bit. <clears throat> Wow, okay, so that was a really long GC that happened in there. But again, uh, we are pushing this application really hard. And if you remember, uh, I started this thing with, um, wow, okay, it's way at the top. Anyways, you remember me uh, starting it up with just 64 megs of RAM. So we're running in a constrained environment. Uh, so, so that GC log analyzer, uh, or whatever anal uh, tool you use to do analysis of GC logs. This is, a, this is actually a really easy way to understand what your application is doing. And the nice thing about the, the producing the garbage collection logs, whether you're running uh, a Zool JDK or Open JDK or whatever, is that it's not intrusive. It basically just spits out information saying, this is, I've just done a GC and it took this long. I did another GC and it took this long. I did another GC and it took this long. And it gives you stats for how much memory is being used and stuff like that. We could actually look at the raw, raw results, but it's, it's more useful to, to look at it in an aggregate like this and get an idea of like, when are we hitting GCs? And oftentimes you can correlate these garbage collection uh, pauses to performance problems in your application. Okay, so this is the, probably the, the most useful thing about that. Now let's open up this other J, let's open up our jhiccup file now. Okay, let's see which one do we want to use. Uh, this one. <clears throat> okay, so this will take a second to boot up. But here, again, this is our jhiccup log file. Right, and you can, again, this is free software. You can download it from our website. But if you look at this, you can see that 
again, that's that thread that sleeps for a millisecond, wakes up, and records the last time it was uh, woken up. So whenever the, the VM is very, very busy, or when it's doing a garbage collection, it will miss, that thread will miss firing on that one millisecond interval, right? And that's what this is producing. It's basically giving us the latency of the JVM, of the running JVM. Okay, so that's what we're specifically measuring. With the garbage collection log analyzer, what were we measuring? We're measuring memory, and memory basically throughput, speed, whatever. What this is measuring specifically is the overall app's CPU utilization and overall load on the app, okay? So let's have a look at this and see what, uh, what it looks like, all right? So if we hover right here, we'll see that it looks like we had uh, 85 millisecond pause right here, right? So this is, uh, this duration is in milliseconds. Uh, this pause was 40 seconds, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you look down here, this is the percentile thing that I was talking about, right? So you can see that we can eyeball this really quickly. Let's zoom in a bit. And it looks like right about here is the 95th, 99th percentile. And our app, in this case, all right, that's in milliseconds. So we can say that for this specific application, right, so it's right here. So it looks like that would probably be about a four millisecond 99th percentile, or a P99 of four milliseconds, which actually is really good, right? So if you have four millisecond latency in your app, you're not worried about it at all, okay? And if we look at the 99th, 95th percentile, that would be approximately right about here, and you can see that uh, the latency is actually very, very low here. So your P95 is probably, I don't know, like two milliseconds or something like that, okay? So that's how we figure out like what's going on with this app. Now the other interesting thing is that if I flip back to this garbage collection log, we can actually correlate the exact time within this J hiccup log analyzer, right? So this happened at uh, the 52 second mark, and if we flip over here, you can see that there was a long garbage collection, actually, let's come down here. <clears throat> right, so that J hiccup thing told us that at approximately, um, whatever, 50 milliseconds or whatever into the application, there was this long pause in the app itself right here, right? So we can actually correlate directly from this J hiccup output when we see latency to this uh, garbage collection chart, right? So we actually see that latency in both ways here, which is really interesting, okay? Let's see what else we wanna look at in terms of these tools, right? Oh, the app is still running, so it's still, <laughs> still going here. Um, now let's, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about garbage collectors, right? Every, every Java developer's favorite topic, garbage collection. Um, so just let me, I just wanna take a quick survey. How many people just use whatever out of the box garbage collector uh, comes with your VM? Okay, how, okay, let me rephrase the question. How many people are using uh, their own like modified, not their own, but how many people set to a different garbage collector? Like is anyone using ZGC? So which one are you using, sir? Using uh, C1? Okay, anybody else? No. Oh, come on now. No, seriously. Oh, okay. We, Parallel for maximum throughput, yep. Right, right, Shenandoah for Java 11. Okay, got you. Okay. Anybody else using something a little bit more uh, exotic than those? Okay, no, but those, that's, so, so uh, you actually made a really good point, right? When, when would you use a serial versus parallel versus Shenandoah versus C1, right? Um, and, and the answer to that is it depends. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, it, it, it really does depend on your application. And unfortunately, I'd love to talk about that, but I could spend the next three hours talking about which garbage collector you should use. So what you should do is if you're interested in talking about it, I'll be at the Azul booth after this. Uh, I'll give you a nice hat and we can talk about garbage collection for the rest of the day, okay? So please stop by uh, if you wanna chat about that. So um, now here's something that's really interesting. There was a research paper that was uh, published, so, since we're talking about garbage collectors, there was a research paper that was recently published, nice hat, um, out of uh, the University of Sydney, Australia and Google, and they have uh, just released this a source code and a really nice white paper or research paper on a new garbage collector that they're working on called LXR, 
Okay? So if you do a Google search, uh, ironically, a Google search for LXR uh, garbage collection Java, you'll find a source repository with this new GC, and uh, you'll find the paper that they've written. And it's actually fascinating because what they've figured out is that they can run a, uh, a garbage collector that pauses, but with a guarantee of no more than a 10 millisecond pause due to the garbage collector. Okay? And a 10 millisecond pause for a very large heap uh, and garbage collection is actually extraordinarily good. Right? So what they do in this, what they did basically is instead of collecting the entire heap when they do a garbage collection and clearing out those old objects, what they do is they limit it to whatever that can be done within a 10 millisecond interval. Right? So it's a fascinating paper. If you're, if you're a garbage collection nerd like I am, uh, go read the paper. You can go download uh, their application and run it, and it's really nice. So, um, and, and, and of course, uh, Azul makes their own garbage collector with collector, collector that comes with our uh, premium VM uh, called the C4 Garbage Collector, uh, which is, uh, again, depending on your use case, is uh, a really good garbage collector for high performance applications. But that's in our proprietary VM, so I'm not going to demo that today. Okay? But if I were to demo it, um, basically, you see all the spikes where it's doing garbage collection here? There would be no spikes because it's a, it's a pauseless garbage collector. It doesn't pause the VM, uh, but um, you know, to everyone in this room is a, a, a professional software developer, right? Uh, so if I were to ask you the question, uh, how can Azul's C4 garbage collector be pauseless, what would your answer be? What trade-off are you making for that? Not throughput. You actually get better throughput with this garbage collector. But you're, get, you're getting close. Right? What trade-off am I making with having a pauseless garbage collector? The, right, so software development, and specifically software architecture, there's one golden rule in it. And Simon may talk about this later. Right? There's one golden rule. Nothing comes for free in software architecture. So the trade-off we make in C4 is you get this amazing pauseless garbage collector with huge amount of throughput, but the trade-off is you need more CPU horsepower to do that. Okay, so again, nothing comes in life. Uh, nothing in life comes for free, uh, and that is uh, definitely true for um, garbage collectors in Java. All right, so I have exactly seven minutes and about 80 more slides to get to. I'm just kidding. Um, so we looked at that. We looked at the the nice little diagram in Visual VM uh, to look at the heap. Um, this is uh, I ran this performance test uh, on the same application with a little bit more memory, and this is what the garbage collector uh, output looked like. Again, this is a, a Azul's GC log analyzer, uh, which is not currently available, uh, but will be uh, hopefully in the near future. Uh, and then we looked at the uh, Visual VM GC plugin, and then of course we looked at jhiccup. And if you remember, right, I don't know if you missed this when I was talking about this, but what we're able to do, for example, with these GC pauses that are here. I can correlate them. This is again. This is our, our GC pause time. I can correlate them directly to these spikes that I see in J Hiccup. Okay, and the reason why J Hiccup again is such a great tool is that it not only measures the the latency of your JVM, but all the way down. So if you have a problem with your disk, uh, you know I've worked with somebody uh, in a little while ago where they were running a little bit slow storage, and we it was a Kafka deployment, and if you're running Kafka. Uh, the number one thing that you need to have to have a performant Kafka cluster is, not CPU, is you need to have really fast storage. So you don't run Kafka on a spinning disk. You have to run it on SSD. Okay? Anyways, but, so we're able to correlate these different uh, J hiccup pauses that we saw directly into garbage collection and into disk I.O. Okay? All right, so we already did the demo. Uh, now let's talk about how some of this magic with this demo worked. Okay? So, um, one thing that a lot of people don't really understand when it comes to performance testing in Java is you can't run something for just five minutes or ten minutes. When I'm running a real performance test, I run it for at least an hour. Okay? So you have, to, you have to put it under load, and you have, to, you have to push it hard, and you have to run it for a long amount of time. Okay? And again, we talked about running on production. <laughs> real load is way better than simulated mode, a load. Right? So if you can, put it into production. Uh, or put some of these tools into production and, and get these results out, okay? The other thing, the other advice I would give you is that 
as a software developer, I make this mistake too, right? It's like I have all my shiny toys, I have like all these tools I'm running, and then I start thinking, oh, maybe it's this, and maybe it's that, and what about this latency, and blah, 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 right? But this is the wrong way to approach any kind of Java performance issue. What you need to do is you focus on your business metric, right? Someone up front said that their SLA with their customer is one second. That should be your one and only goal at that given point in time. So just focus on the metric that you want to hit and forget about everything else, because otherwise you'll just, uh, we have a saying in, in America called, you just spin your wheels in mud, right? So you just get stuck and you won't make any progress, right? And so what would those metrics be? We talked about some of those already. It could be response time, it could be throughputs, not having any timeouts, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And so you probably saw this earlier, uh, but to, to enable garbage collection, again, enabling the garbage collection statistics is, uh, is very non-intrusive, right? So you can do this and not have to pay a big penalty for it, or any penalty for that matter, uh, but this is how you do it. You basically use dash x log, and then you specify the GC log file. Okay, pretty straightforward. The other thing that I'll warn you about, and again, I make this mistake all the time too, which is I love fiddling around with all the different uh, Java VM flags. It's like, hey, maybe if I set this like this, it'll work better. Or maybe if I set this, maybe that'll get, uh, get me to where this problem is fixed, right? But again, uh, as a software developer, I, I want to do that, but I try to avoid doing that because you just end up, again, spinning your wheels and not making any progress, okay? All right, so in terms of analyzing perf data, if GC pauses are a problem, uh, you enable GC logging um, and maybe you know, after, you, after you've done some analysis, then go and change the garbage collection uh, algorithm you're using. You know, you can try Shenandoah, you can try C1, whatever, serial versus parallel. Um, and of course, you have to figure out what your app is actually doing. You know, are you concerned about throughput, low latency, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we use Visual VM in here. I don't have time to do a Java Flight Recorder demo, but that can also be very useful if you're seeing CPU problems. You can run a profile for like five or 10 minutes, take that profile data, dump it into Visual VM, and then have a look and see where your CPU bottleneck is, okay? <clears throat> All right, so other things to consider. I hinted at this already, right? The reason why we run a perf test for an hour is because it takes a while for the JIT compiler to really, really get good at optimizing your code. So you can't run it for five or 10 minutes. And you have to run under load and you have to exercise all the code paths that you would normally uh, be running in production um, with real usage, okay? <clears throat> all right, finding bottlenecks. We talked about this already, so let me just summarize. We wanna correlate the J hiccup latency with garbage collection and with thread contention. Okay, so that's what we did. I showed both those graphs. One was the J hiccup, one was the garbage collector. And if we were to look at the peaks for both of them, we would see that J hiccup and the garbage collection logs would show latency when there was a garbage collection going on, right? So that's the, kind of the easiest thing to do, okay? And I already spoke a little bit about operating system bottlenecks like disk that uh, you need to worry about. But again, J hiccup will show that in the log file. All right, so uh, you can take thread dumps uh, if you uh, suspect that either you have uh, locked objects, shared locked objects, or other things like that. And this is really easy to do, jstack-l, fairly non-intrusive because it just takes a dump, prints it out, and the VM keeps going, okay? And what we typically like to do when we're looking at uh, a potential CPU or locking or other type of problem that's related to threads is that we, we take these thread dumps on an interval. So I basically just have a bash script that wakes up every 10 seconds, runs JSTAC, outputs that data somewhere, and then run it again 10 seconds later, run it again 10 seconds. So typically, I'll do five minutes of that so I have a time series of these uh, uh, thread dumps to look at to see if there's some kind of locking or contention issue going on there, okay? All right, and then um, there's also J. There's well, there's a few other ones, but I'll try to finish up real quick. Um, and to to do analysis of those thread dumps, uh, <laughs> you can you can do them just by looking at them raw. But uh, it's it's going to be a lot of data. And it's hard to really see anything in there um, because if you've ever taken a thread dump, the the first thing on a thread dump line is the actual uh, name or the number of the thread. 
right? And so you have to correlate that specific thread. What is it doing now? What's it doing 10 seconds from now? What's it doing 20 seconds from now? Uh, and that can get a little onerous, but there are some nice tools. There's this thing called jstack.review, uh, which is not free, but you can put in, you know, you can try it out and see if it's worth uh, your while. But there's the jprofiler app, which is free, and IBM also makes a thread dump analyzer, which is very good. Okay, so these are a couple of tools that you can use to look at thread dumps. All right, um, so in terms of heap dumps, if you, if you think that there's a problem with memory, uh, you can use something called JCMD uh, to take heap dumps. And again, you take these heap dumps in intervals. With heap dumps, because it can be intrusive, right? Because it, it has to go and look at all the memory that you have and then dump out uh, the information about it. Um, I generally take a heap dump on like a one or five minute interval rather than every 10 seconds, okay? Because then uh, you might be overloading your JVM by taking these heap dumps, okay? And of course, if you're getting out of memory errors, you can add this flag heap dump on out of memory error, uh, which will dump the memory whenever you run out of memory, or sorry, dump the heap uh, statistics when you run out of memory. All right, so fix and repeat. Uh, one thing, I think I mentioned this already, but I'll reiterate it. Uh, try to only fix one thing at a time, right? Only make one change at a time instead of making a whole bunch. Um, and then look at, you know, look at your results and see what you get from there. Okay, uh, so that's uh, um, a minute or two over time, and I want to let Simon get up here so he can give his presentation. Uh, but if you, if you will come to the Azul booth, uh, I'll be happy to take questions there. Uh, Garrett from our team is also here. Uh, so thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this talk.